Hallelujah. I want to talk to you tonight around that theme. No oath against me will stand. No oath against me shall stand. Hallelujah. I want to take you to the book of Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. And I'm going to read from verse 11. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Now, therefore, you with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow. As though you would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. And when Paul's nephew heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto you who had something to say. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou would bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, see that you tell no man that you have showed these things to me. Let me jump to the book of Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Let me just give you a summary of this story, where this passage that I read in the book of Acts chapter 23, what surrounded this story. The Apostle Paul was warned by brethren not to go to Jerusalem. He was first told in Tyre by disciples there. You can read Acts chapter 21 and verse 4. Where the Bible says, finding disciples, they waited there seven days. And they said to Paul through the Holy Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. And through who? The Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 21... And verse 11, he was warned a second time by prophet Agabus. It says, when he was come to us, he took Paul's girdle, that is Agabus, and bound his own hands and feet and said, thus saith the Holy Ghost. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, despite all the prophetic warnings, I can just imagine the daughters of Evangelist Philip 
in whose house prophet uh, Paul was, they also ministered to Paul and possibly would have told Paul the same thing. Don't go to Jerusalem because trouble awaits you. But despite all of the prophetic warnings, Paul was still determined to go to Jerusalem where a few things happened to him. Number one, he was received gladly by the brethren in Acts 21 verse 17. He met Apostle James and the Gentiles through his ministry. Sorry, he met Apostle James, sorry, and the elders and gave a report of the things God was doing among the Gentiles through his ministry. So he gave his, his, his missionary report. The brethren glorified God because of his testimony. He was counseled by the Jewish Christians to take a purification vow to pacify religious Jews who wanted to keep the law of Moses. Paul entered a vow, a Nazarite vow for seven days with other men. He shaved his head just like them, that he wasn't against the law of Moses. He paid, even paid for their offerings as well. Now, nearing the end of the seven days, there were some Jews from Asia, religious people, who seeing Paul laid an accusation against him and got the crowd to be riled up against him. He was arrested. Now, a mob of religious people dragged him out of the church, the temple and sought to kill him because of the accusations. They didn't prove anything. It was just accusations that they heard. Now the chief captain of the soldiers heard it and rescued him from the mob. Now Paul also addressed the crowd and tried to give his testimony concerning Jesus. However, in his address, he told them of a prophecy given to him concerning the Jews in Jerusalem that they would not receive Paul's testimony concerning Jesus. That's Acts 22 verse 17. You can read it. This is where Jesus spoke to him, where he was in a trance, the Bible said, and sawing Jesus. Jesus said to him, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me now the jews refused to hear paul and wanted to kill him and remove his memory from the earth huh. the chief captain wanted to beat him but paul invoked his roman citizenship by birth it shook the soldier who got his citizenship by money now the chief captain called the high priest and his council to appear before him so that he could determine what Paul did. Paul spoke harshly to the high priest and somebody slapped him in the face. And Paul said, why did you slap me? And he said, you speak to the high priest with disrespect. Paul apologized because he didn't know that he was talking to the chief priest. Now when Paul realized what was going on, he lit a fire between the two factions, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, by speaking about resurrection because he knew this would have divided them. Now, a great disagreement between those who wanted to kill Paul occurred. So they forgot that they wanted to kill him and started to quarrel with each other. Now, the soldiers had to remove Paul from their midst because one side wanted to rip him this way. Another side wanted to protect him because of the resurrection. Now a sinister plot of more than 40 men was in gear to kill Paul. Come on now. More than 40 men wanted to kill him. And they got their conspiracy ratified by the chief priest, by the high priest. Acts 23, verse 14. Yes. The chief priest of the temple ratified their actions, their plot to kill Paul. They took an oath not to eat anything until they killed Paul. <laughs> but guess what? This oath went on for over 
two years. Paul was in their midst for two years and they couldn't touch him. Hmm. Jesus. And after two years, Paul left to go towards Rome. Whether they ate or not is beyond me. I don't know whether these men ate or whether they did not eat because they said they were taking an oath not to. We're going to talk about that. Now, Paul was eventually sent to Felix, who wanted to know more about the way, as they called it, and kept bringing Paul before him for two years while Paul was in prison. Paul reasoned with him about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come. So Paul took the opportunity, brethren, to speak the gospel. Felix eventually left and Festus came. Now Festus wanted to gain favor with the Jews and sought to do something for them so that he could gain their favor. It was then that the Jews who wanted to kill Paul for two years approached Festus to send Paul to Jerusalem to stand trial and they would lay in wait by the roadside, ambush the caravan and kill Paul. Festus agreed to this. Go read Acts 25 verse 1 to 3. However, while talking to Paul, Paul appealed to Caesar's judgment seat and was sent to Rome. What a journey. What an interesting turn of events from the three prophetic encounters that Paul had. One in Tyre and two in Caesarea. There are a lot of questions that we need to ask. A lot. A lot of questions about what do we do when we hear prophetic warnings? What do we do if a man of God, if a woman of God, comes to us and legitimately gives us a warning by the Spirit? What do we do? What do you do when the prophecy and the revelation you are getting right now seems to contradict what you have received years ago. What do you do when the word you are getting in your spirit to go to a particular place doesn't seem to be the same word that others are getting? What do you do? Now, because of the position Paul took, that is, what position? To live for Christ, people were offended at him and wanted to kill him. I want to say this to you, brethren. The position you have taken to live for Christ, don't think that everybody is happy with you. It was not the world who wanted to kill Paul. It wasn't the Gentiles who wanted to kill Paul. It was the religious people. The people who were okay with their religion. They didn't want nothing to change. They were okay with their routine. They were okay with doing things the same way over and over and over again even though it wasn't producing any result for them. They were okay with staying the way they were. And the moment they were challenged by the presence of a man who said nothing to them about what they were doing, but only just went into the church just to pray and fulfill his vow, here comes men, lay an accusation against him and rail up the crowd to kill him. This is how the devil works. He uses people in your own circle 
People whom you think would understand. People who you think would get it. People who you think would want to grow in Christ. And would want what God has for them. But you are mistaken. And we are mistaken. Those are the very people. That are so opened. To being used by the devil. Why? Because they refuse. To die to self. So that they can live. Through Christ. Here are men who came and accused Paul of some religious mumbo-jumbo that don't even make sense. Showing men that, oh, we are pious for our religion. We are zealous for our religion. But in truth and in fact, they weren't. They just hated Paul. The moment you get a revelation of Jesus. The moment you come in encounter with Jesus. The moment you begin to live for Jesus and begin to preach Jesus. You are enemy of the state. Public enemy number one. You see, they couldn't stand the truth. Which Paul preached with his mouth. No, the manner of life he lived by example. The moment you begin to speak truth and to live that truth, people are going to be offended at you. They wanted to kill Paul. They didn't even stop to prove what these men were saying. You see, be careful of the accusations of the enemy. Because these accusations are looking for an open door to strike you. It is looking to get people to turn against you. That, that's what the devil wants. To get people to turn against you. And the moment people turn against you, it's trouble. You don't have to say or do anything. But let them believe a lie. Simply because they can't discern the truth. They will turn against you. They didn't care about Paul's testimony. They didn't care about the things God did through him. They didn't care to hear about Christ. They just wanted to kill him. Listen to me. There are people who don't care about you. About what God has done in you. About what God has done for you. About what God has done through you. And about what God is going to use you to do. They don't care. They just want to kill you. Because your presence offends them. Period. There are some people that are just full of hate. Full of hatred in their heart. Because their heart has not been touched by the light of God. They refuse to allow it to touch them. And the worst thing about this is that these are people in the church. They are okay with their granny's religion. They are okay with their old time religion. This is the way it has been for 50 years. This is how my church has done it. For 30 years, this is what my pastor said to me and said to us, and we will not change it. But the moment you challenge what is said in the face, with the face of truth, they are ready to kill you. Religious people will kill you and feel no remorse. They will destroy your business, your ministry, your family. They will destroy you and feel happy about it. Why do you think 
Some people can just turn against you. Simply in the face of an accusation. It is not because, brethren, they know some truth behind the scenes about what has been said. No, in their heart, from the very beginning, they had no capacity to love you. And because they had no such capacity, no matter what you say to them, no matter how you bring the truth to them, they will not and cannot hear it. Some are so bound by their idolatry, their idolatrous hearts, that they just want to hear something. They're not going to ratify it. They're not going to try it. They're not going to test it to see if it is true. No, they will not. Because they are looking for a way to kill you. I put it to you concerning Paul. That because Paul left them, these religious people, these Pharisees and these Sadducees, because he stopped pursuing the Christians to kill them. They had an art against him. They wanted a way to kill him. And from the time Paul encountered Jesus, he never returned to Jerusalem up until this point. So this was their opportunity to let their hatred be seen. Listen, some people, you think time would heal them. You think time would allow them to come to common sense. But when a man hates you, he hates you. And no amount of time will fix that. Only the blood of Jesus can change a man's heart concerning you. No amount of time will change how they feel about you. If it takes 10 years for them to see you, to get an opportunity to execute their evil against you, they will. You see, this is why it is important, brethren, that you take no offense at people. You give no offense and you take none. You allow forgiveness to rule your heart. They wanted to kill Paul. That was the end of the story. And they were looking for a way to do it. Now, here's what we need to understand. Some people don't care about your progress in Christ. You would think that they are happy that you are now hearing from God. You think that they are happy that you are now spending time in prayer and your prayer life is growing and your worship life is growing and your understanding of the word is growing and your revelation of Jesus is growing. You think they would be happy for you. No, 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 no. You, you think again. You are around some religious people. Who love it the way they have it. Because your growth in Christ. Is an offense to them. Your growth in Christ. Is a judgment on them. Please understand this. It is challenging them to change. And because they don't want to change. They will find a way to kill you. This is what is happening to many believers, children of God, called into ministry, called by God, being raised up by the Holy Ghost. You want to continue amongst the religious people that you are among. But the truth is, you can't. You want to go into their midst to change them. But the truth is, you can't. 
because religious people don't want to be changed. The quicker you accept this, the better for you. Mm. There are some people you think they are spiritual. No, they are religious. Check them very carefully. Check them very carefully. They do the same thing over and over and over. They are like hamsters on a wheel. Break, Try to break that cycle and you will see what I'm talking about. Try to bring something new, something different, something fresh. And you will see what I'm talking about. The moment you try it, you have initiated your death. Just stay. Let things stay the way they are. Let things remain the way they are. Come in. Enjoy it with us. Don't challenge it. Don't talk about it. Don't speak about it. Accept it. And everything will be fine. But try to bring light in their midst. Try to, to, to share the testimony of what God is doing through you. Listen. They will look for a way to kill you. Hmm. They don't care about how God is using you. And the things he has done through you. They will hate you. Why? Because they hate Jesus. Uh oh, I said it. They talk about, oh, they love Jesus. No, it's not true. It is not true. They hate Jesus. Because if they loved him, they would have done the things he wanted them to do. One of which is be kind one to another. Please understand, there are a lot of things going on here in Paul's story. The sad thing about what happened to Paul is not the Romans who wanted to kill him. It wasn't the soldiers who wanted to kill him. It was the Jews. People who knew religion. People who had the word, but no revelation of it. People who had the Bible. When I say the Bible, I mean the Torah that they had. But no understanding of it. You would think that they do. But the truth is they don't. Because here is the truth. If in all your reading of the scriptures... You do not understand that it is about Jesus Christ. Your understanding is not fruitful. If in all the reading of the scriptures, you have not gotten a revelation of Jesus Christ, then all you are doing is just reading. <laughs> Oh boy, I'm stepping hard tonight. But the moment you try to bring a revelation and an understanding of Jesus in their midst, it's trouble. Because here it is, brethren. If Jesus enters, entertainment stops. Stardom stops. Self-glory stops. Praise of men stops. In fact, every religious mumbo-jumbo that was going on will stop. And to stop that is to stop their way of life. They don't want to give that up. Interfere with some teachings and you are killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yes. There are some things that we know as pastors that have no bearing in Christian practice. That if we preach it, the same men that laid hands on us, blessed us and sent us out for ministry. Would seek to kill us. But the truth. Must be spoken. The truth. Must be said. Because when you come into. An encounter. And a revelation of Jesus Christ. You and not continue the same way. And you will want to liberate everybody who has been under chains and yokes so that they too can come into freedom. There is no freedom in religion. Religion is a chain that binds. It binds the eyes and hearts of men. It blocks your common sense and your sensibility. It shuts down your discernment. Because it keeps you in a cycle. Going around the same bush. Like a hamster on a wheel. Going but going nowhere. Running but not moving. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're going to seek to kill me. But thank God, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Religious folk, 40 plus of them, took an oath to kill Paul. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm talking about. I have come under the fire of religious people where they banded together to pray against me, to kill me. But like Paul, God's mercies prevailed. Now we can ask some questions. Could this be have been avoided if Paul had heeded the promptings of the Holy Spirit through the brethren not to go to Jerusalem? They're asking questions. If the Lord wanted him there at that time, why warn him about what was to come? We are asking questions. Was it the will of God for Paul to go to Rome by passing through Jerusalem? We're asking questions. Come on, you need to ask questions. If you don't ask, you're not going to get answers. Would God be determined to send you to a destination, but allow you to pass through the road of trial to get there? They're asking questions. These are some serious questions. If in my heart I feel like God is sending me to a particular place, but here comes reputable believers who hear from the Spirit, who are giving me warnings about the troubles that await me, should I still go? They're asking questions. There will be two sides of the fence here, you know. One group will say, hey, Pursue what is in thy heart because God is speaking to you. Another group will say, hey, but the Holy Spirit is talking to you. Listen and learn wisdom and take counsel and, 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 and don't go. You see, th th there is no easy answer to this. All I see here is that there is a man called Paul who was determined to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and it doesn't matter if he died. When you are resigned in Jesus, nothing matters, honestly. Absolutely nothing matters. This entire story is a whole prophetic study. To understand the rudiments of dissecting prophetic words and what to do with such words when you get them. When and how do I dismiss the promptings of the Holy Spirit when there are clear warnings ahead of me concerned with, with that, 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 that spell trouble? I gave you 20 points earlier concerning Paul's journey in that little story and the troubles that he went through. Had he not gone to Jerusalem, nobody would want to kill him. He would not have been arrested. Certain things would not have happened to him. But through God's mercies, he was spared. You see, sometimes we may be told by God what is to come. But because we are determined in our heart to get where we want to get to, we may disregard those warnings. We may be right in our destination. In where God wants us to go. We may be very right. Yes, we may have heard from God. And we know what God is saying to us. And we know where God wants to take us. But we may be wrong in how to get there. Please understand that. When God is speaking, listen. Because there are some things that can be avoided. The route that you think to get to where you want to get to might not be the route that God wants you to use. Now, there are two things here that we, we, need, to, we, we need to pay attention to. The Holy Ghost is not no spooky spirit. It's not no syncretic spirit. It's not no boogeyman spirit. It was the Holy Spirit through three companies of prophetic people that spoke to Paul and said, hey, Paul, you are going to Jerusalem. There is trouble. The disciples in Tyre, the virgin daughters in, in, in Philip's house, prophet Agabus that came down. And use what we call emblematic prophetic uh, 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 ministry to speak to Paul. But yet he did not listen. He was determined to go to Jerusalem. Listen, brethren, sometimes we may be determined to go to a place, but I beg you. Listen to what God is saying to you now. Yes, you may feel in your heart that God is sending you, you to that place, but it might not be time. Because right now, if you go, oh Jesus, you might die. You see, there are some things that I, I want to, to bring up potently to you. It was not because Paul could pray or Paul could praise or any of that or because Paul was a good defense lawyer. No, the man laid up a good defense for his case, you know. But it wasn't any of that. It was the mercies of God that kept him. 
And because of his mercies, he will turn things around in our favor. Why? Because of his plan. Not because of our zealousness for the Lord. Sometimes our zeal can get us killed. Yes, you might be feeling that, oh, I need to go around Jamaica and go on every mountain and pray against the powers of darkness in Jamaica. Yes, you might be feeling that, but it might not be time. Yes, you might be hearing that, but it might not be time. And this is where a lot of us miss it big time. Because we are so determined and zealous to get things done and to get things going and to see things come to pass and to see things fulfilled that we miss the opportunities of listening to the Spirit and considering what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. God doesn't have time to waste. He doesn't waste words. If you don't want the counsel of God, why come to the prophet? If you don't want to hear what the spirit of God is saying, why come to the prophet? Some of you are hell-bent on doing what you want to do. You call it zeal, but it's a mask for stubbornness, some of you. You can't wait on God to chart the route for you. You can't wait on God to plot the course for you. You don't know God's route to get you to the destination he has revealed to you. So the best thing you do is wait on him to take you there. Some of you get into trouble. Not because God doesn't want you to go to this particular place or do this particular thing or meet this particular person. It's not that. It's because you went out on wrong timing. You took the wrong route to get there. And because you took the wrong route to get there, the devil was able to open doors for men to plot to kill you. Uh oh But by his mercies, no oath, no weapon formed against me shall stand. Mm. Because God knows his plan. And his plans concerning me will not fail. That's the promise he has given to us. I know the plans I have for you, see the Lord. Plans to prosper you and to bring you to an expected end. You will get to that end, you know. You will get to that place. It's not an if, it's not a maybe. You will get there. You will. But sometimes because we are too stubborn, too zealous, too impatient that not prescribed in God's plan. You say, prophet, but how do I know what route God is taking? Listen to the voice of the Holy Ghost. Listen to the voice of the Spirit. Listen. Because if you don't listen, you might very well take a road that will cause you to end up in trouble. We can argue this thing about Paul. Some will argue and say, oh, it was God's will for him to go to, to Jerusalem. Uh -huh. But was it God's will for him to get there that way? It was God's will for him to get to Rome.
But was it God's will for him to get there that way? Come on, let's 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 think as Christians. What if Paul had listened to the disciples in Tyre, prophet Agabus, and say, "Hear what? I hear the Holy Ghost. I won't go to Jerusalem at this time." Do you know we would have had a different record? Yes, we could. We could have a different record. In the prophetic realm of knowledge, there is a dimension called the things that could be. You don't have to end up at the could be. Because it's predicated on an if, conditional on choices you make. And what prevents us from going down that road are the warnings, the promptings, the revelations of the Holy Spirit that guides us in a particular way. Yes, God said you're going to be married. And he even show you who your spouse is. But wait on him now. Don't force the issue. Yes, God says, you're going to go to this particular country. But wait on him now. Don't force the issue. We have a lot of people today who are forcing issues. A lot. You see, my message is twofold to you tonight. A lot of people who are forcing issues. And when you force issues, you will end up in trouble. You see, we may suffer some things if we go against God's counsel. The counsel of the Lord is to protect us from unnecessary pain. There are some pains that are inevitable because of your walk with Christ. But there are some pains that can be avoided. This is why we have the spirit of counsel. This is why we have the word of wisdom. Yes, every man is responsible to do with the word and the revelation he has received from the mouth of the prophet of the, of the prophetic people and the mouth of the prophets. Yes, it's your responsibility to decide what you want to do with it. You can discard it or you can take counsel from it. It's up to you. But let me tell you, which a decision you make you will have to live with the outcome you will have to live with the outcome and if you're not strong enough to bear the, the outcome of pain from some of these decisions, you might very well end up be killed by people who are looking for an opportunity to kill you. I hope you are listening to me tonight. Take heed and learn from Paul. He was destined to go to Rome because it was prophesied. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and before kings and the children of Israel. Do you see the progression? Gentiles. Where did Paul go in ministry? To the Gentiles. Who was he supposed to bear record to after that? 
kings. Who was last? The children of Israel. But he went to the children of Israel before he went to the kings. Didn't God have a plan to fulfill his own word? Brethren, I want to speak to you as a prophet tonight. You cannot fulfill God's word for him. God's word will fulfill you. You can't decide how you're going to fulfill the prophecy that God gave you. No, the prophecy will fulfill you. If God said it, it will come to pass. Too many of us are trying to fulfill God's word. And I know what you have been taught. And I know what you have heard. And I know what has been said to you. But here is truth. Hear the counsel of the prophet tonight. Let God's word fulfill his own word. He knows the route he's going to take. To take you where he wants to. Stop trying to help God. For you might end up in some trials you can't bear. In Acts 22 verse 21, he said unto me, depart, for I will send him be, send thee far from hence unto the Gentiles. That's in Acts chapter 22 and verse 21. Told him, get out of this place. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, the mercies of God. I see God's mercies in Paul's story that even during the moments of his testing, the Lord reassured him, be of good cheer, Acts 23, 11. For as you have testified of me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also at Rome. It's the mercies of God. Now I may be wrong. I may be wrong that God wanted him to go to Jerusalem first before he entered Rome. Who knows the full mind of God? But couldn't God have taken him to Rome without, of, without causing him to go through the pains in Jerusalem? Yes. Why all the prophecies? Was it just to prepare Paul for the trials that he was going to face? Maybe. But couldn't it be too that God was saying to him, Hey Paul, I know you're zealous about going to Jerusalem, but there is another way. On your way to fulfilling your call, your destiny, your purpose, your prophecy, your assignment, whatever you may call it, you will encounter people who want to kill you. Now let's shift another gear. You will encounter people who will want to kill you. If you have not encountered people who want to kill you, not just physically, but in other areas, get rid of you out of the job. Destroy your finances, destroy your marriage, destroy your ministry. Yes, that's the working of death. They want to kill you. If you've not encountered people like that, then maybe your assignment is not a God assignment. <laughs> because the moment you begin to embark on the journey of God's plan for your life, you're going to encounter these people. You're going to encounter these religious folk. Now, when we come back to Paul's story, 
there were 40 plus men, over 40 men, who took an oath against Paul to kill him. But through the mercies of our God, oh my God, come on, somebody need to say through his mercies, no weapon formed against Paul could prosper. You see, people will take oath against you, but be of good cheer. It will not work. Your prophecy, hear me. Your prophecy is greater than their oath. Oh my God. Can I, can I say that to somebody tonight? I said your prophecy is greater than their oath. The plan of God for your life is greater than their oath. Let 40 of them gather at the altar and take the oath. Let 40 of them bring 40 white rabbits, 40 black goats, 40 speckled pigeon. It doesn't matter. God's plan, God's prophecy, God's word concerning your life is greater than their oath. Oh my God. Let's, let's shift another gear. When God revealed to Paul what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem, God already knew that Paul was going to go and God already had a plan to take him out of it. God knows those who love him. Yes. He knows the people who love him, who despite the atrocities ahead of them, the God of Daniel, they will still go. <laughs> so yes, I may be zealous and stupid, But God's mercy will protect me in my stupidity. Of course it will. Yes, you will bear some pain, no doubt. But it will. It will protect you. Thanks be to God. He's greater than the oath of men. He's greater than my stupidity, my stubbornness, and my zealousness. He's greater than it all. Aren't you happy that God's mercies have kept you? There are some decisions that we have made. That if not for the mercies of God, we would have been killed, dead, finished, forgotten, rotten. But I am glad that God's mercies are bigger than me. God's mercies are bigger than the obia man, bigger than the witch, bigger than the wizard, bigger than the warlock. Come on, God's mercies concerning my life are bigger than any vow, any oath, any contract, any covenant that could be taken out against my life. I don't know how many times they might have taken out a contract against you in the spirit. I don't know how many times they might have accused you before others, but every time they tried, they failed. Oh, I should not have come to the ninth month of the year this year. You shouldn't have reached this far this year. But because God's mercies are greater, more powerful, mightier than the plans of men, made it made it come on you need to tell yourself that i made it and i am still going to fulfill the prophecy over my life 
I made it and I'm still going to fulfill the prophecy over my life. I came through the accusation. I came through the plot. I came through the spiritual conspiracy. I came through the, 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 the evil fastings of men. Oh, I came through it. Even though they laid traps against me, God still made a way. Oh God, even when it looked as if I wasn't going to be able to come out of this one, God still made a way. Come on, will you, will you at this time just give God some praise for his grace, for his goodness in the midst of my foolishness, in the midst of my misunderstanding, in the midst of my zealousness and stupidity, when the enemy said, yes, I have got him where I want him now. Oh, God still made a way. Hallelujah. And I'm going to fulfill my purpose. I'm going to fulfill my destiny. I'm going to fulfill God's plan for my life, even though I took a road I shouldn't. Oh, God, am I talking to somebody here tonight? Even though some things happened in your life that should not have happened. Even though you had to encounter some things that could have been avoided. Yet in the midst of my trial, Yet in the midst of my pain, yet in the midst of me not knowing what to do, God still made a way because there is a law written in his word that says no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that rise up against me, he said in judgment, I will condemn because this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, seeth God. For you to kill me, you have to kill God's plan. I'm going to say it. I, I, I just heard something dropped in my spirit. I, I heard, I am God's plan for my generation. I am God's plan for my generation. Mm -mm. My God. So for you to kill me, you have to kill God's plan. Good luck with that. Hallelujah. I said, good luck with that. Here, here is why some of you, oh, and I'm going to be bold and brazen, bare faced. To and, 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 and say what I'm about to say. Some of you, the devil wants to kill you. But you know why he can't kill you? Because you are connected to me. Not because of me. But you're a part of my plan and I am God's plan. Hallelujah. You're a part of the plan that I am a part of. How then can the enemy kill you? He can't. He cannot. It's not possible. You have made some wrong turns in your life. Some accusations have been levied at you. But you're a part of the plan that Prophet Bernard is a part of. That's why we met. That's why our paths crossed. That's why we connected. Because there is something about your life that is connected to my life and my life that is connected to your life and our life that is connected to God's plan. That no matter how they take an oath, no matter where they go to take that oath, no matter how many of them come together to agree with that oath, it still will not work because it is not greater than the plan, the eternal plan of God for our life. Come on, stay with me tonight. Hallelujah. Now, 
Let's understand what these men did. They took an oath. What is an oath? An oath is a promise made to another person in the presence of God. The presence of God is ratified by a representative of his who holds an office appointed by him. In the case of the 40 plus men, they made the oath before the chief priest. The office of the chief priest was an office appointed by God. Whether the person is there because of God or whether they are there because of some unscrupulous means, it doesn't matter. The office is what you should look at. There is power in the office. You see, you have to be careful about people who go to pastors and prophets and, and apostles and whoever are people are in power to ratify their wickedness against you. Be careful. It is only God who can defeat that. Hmm. The men took an oath. That's the, it wasn't no ordinary oath. They bound themselves to the most severe of divine penalties if they were not able to execute their promise. They made themselves culpable to the faith they wanted to give to Paul. That is to kill him. If they couldn't kill him, then what they were saying is that God should kill them. That's what an oath is. An oath is a promise you have made to do something. And you have made that promise in the presence of God. So here is the reason you should not take an oath. Because you don't know what the future holds. You are not God. You do not control the happenings of time. This is why Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't swear. To swear is to commit suicide by your own words. Do you know what time holds in the future? Do you know how things are going to play out in the future? Do you know what is going to happen? The circumstances that must come together. Can you orchestrate circumstances to get things done? Are you God? You're not God. There was one prophet called Jonah. God told him, go to Nineveh. He decided, no, I'm not going to know Nineveh. I'm going to Tarshish. Boarded the boat to Tarshish. And God orchestrated circumstances to get him to Nineveh. God did that. As far as Jonah was concerned, I am going to Tashish. Listen, you're not God. And those who are taking oath against you, remember this, they are not God. Those who have gone to their Jujuman, their Wujuman, their Gadet, their, their whoever, their Rosicrucian priest, their high priest, let go but arm yourself with this faith they are not God let them pledge all they want to pledge bring all the goats on their farm even bring the white cow they are not God let them give the virginity of their child sacrifice their firstborn Bring all the money in their account. <laughs> they are not God. Those devils are not God. Hate me all you want. Plan to kill me all you want. You are not God. We have a saying. When man is planning, God is wiping. 
I am too precious to God for him to allow men who hate him to kill me. Come on, you need to know that you are too precious to God. Some of you are worrying about things that you should be sleeping on. Worrying about people that you have no business worrying about. Are they God? Yes, they went and they accused you. Yes, they told lies on you. And nobody wants to believe you. Are they God? Yes, I'm about to be fired. So what? Are they God? Oh, I'm about to lose my job. Are they God? Oh, they kicked me out of the church and I no longer have any ministry. Are they God? I was a prince in Egypt and now I have to run away. Are they God? Oh, he's a great prophet and everything he says come to pass. Is he God? Oh, it's a mighty church and they have many intercessors praying against me. Are they God? Am I talking to you tonight? Am I talking to my people tonight? You need to be reminded that they can bind themselves to any oath. Let them even bind themselves to a tree. Let them walk around and drink blood as their water. I don't care. Are they God? So what if they don't want to, to, to lay hands on me? What if, what if they don't? Listen, you see, Virgin, you need to reach a place in your life where you understand who your God is. What if they forsake me? What if they never turn up when I am sick? When, 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 when my body is sick. It's not I am sick. When my body is sick. Are they God? What if they choose everybody else and they didn't choose you? Are they God? I know what God has said to me. They were not a part of my conversation with God. God did not invite them into the room when he was speaking to me. He never consulted with them when he made plans for my life. You weren't there when I had a revelation of Jesus. So how on this God's green earth with the dry Sahara desert do you think that you can stop God's plan for my life. Bind yourself to any oath you want. You still not stop me. Oh Jesus. Mighty God of Daniel. Thank you Holy Ghost. So here are some declarations we're going to make tonight. You see, because they are not God. And you see, because God's word is bigger, mightier, more powerful. Then Proverbs 26 verse 27. I say this to those who have taken out an oath against me. Whoever. Digs a pit shall fall into it. And a stone will come back on him who starts rolling it. So whoever is digging pit for my life and for your life, we evoke Proverbs 26, 27. Come on, you need, you need to learn how to make some powerful declarations. So they took oath against me. That's okay. Isaiah 54, 17. You see, they spoke. Now it's my turn. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. 
and every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment I shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Every weapon of the tongues of evil men formulated against me to do me evil, I evoke Isaiah 54, 17. Be condemned now. Oh, so you, you, you took oath against me and you spoke. That's okay. Colossians 2 verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Oh, he didn't know that I could speak every accusation against me. Meet the cross of Jesus now. We evoke Colossians 2.13 against you. We erase you with the blood of Jesus. I'm not done. Deuteronomy 28 verse 7. They took an oath, 40 of them. No worries. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. Every enemy risen against me, singular and communal. We evoke Deuteronomy 28 7 against you now. Be smitten, driven away, utterly broken, confounded, and sent back in the name of Jesus. You took an oath against me. Isaiah 49 verse 24. Can the prey be taken from the mighty or the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus saith the Lord, even the captains of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your savior and your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Call on those who seek to oppress me to judgment now. I call them now to the judgment seat. And I evoke Isaiah 49, 24 to 26 against them. Let the Most High contend with them according to his word in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. No weapon, no oath against me shall stand. I may take a wrong turn. I may make some stupid decisions. Yes, it will happen. I'm human. There are times I do things that are foolish. But know this one thing. The plans that God have for our life is greater than even our stupidity. And no matter how the enemy brings his little rodents together, to destroy our life. It shall never work. Hallelujah. It will never work. Amen. And amen.